As you guys know, in this seven-month season of our church, we are focusing in on Jesus, the most controversial man ever. And over the course of the seven months, really from now up through Easter, we're breaking this season down into small kind of bite-sized series in which we look at Jesus from different angles. So right now we're asking, who was he? But we're also going to ask, who was he for? What was his agenda? What, how does he feel about Christmas? Bet you can't guess when we'll talk about that. Okay, we're even going to do a WWJD series in which uh, we ask ourselves, what would Jesus like actually do if he was here and alive in the 21st century? Like, what would Jesus do if he was the pastor of Northeast Christian Church? I'll go ahead and tell you, you might not attend this church. Like, okay, what would Jesus do if he was the president of our country? What would Jesus do if he was an artist today in the 21st century? What would Jesus do if he found himself right in the middle of all this politically divisive and emotionally charged debates? Okay, and I'll just tell you, if you stick with us over the course of this seven-month season, one of two things will happen. You'll either end up a whole lot closer to Jesus, because if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you, or you'll end up at a different church. Just saying. Because it's going to be one of those series where no topics are off guard and we are going to get as clear of a picture as Jesus as possible. And what I found is when people get a clear picture of Jesus, they're either compelled toward him or repelled from him. I mean, just look at his life in the Bible. Now, with that being said, uh, this is kind of week two of the whole season. And uh, in these first two weeks, we're answering uh, the re really simple but kind of foundation-laying question of who was he? Who was Jesus? What was his identity, right? And uh, last week we started off by looking at his identity from a kind of divine perspective. Do you remember what we said? Last week we said Jesus is God in a bod. I told you you'd remember it, okay? You hate me for it, but I told you you'd remember it. Now, this week we're going to look at it from a little bit of a different angle. And in order to do that, we're going to have to wade into the choppy waters of American politics. Oh, joy. So let's just, let's just start off with a really, really dangerous question. Today, all right. Let me ask you: If Jesus were alive today, what do you think? Would he be patriotic? <laughs> and this is a, this is a rhetorical question. All right, no need to stand up and give a monologue. Just take a deep breath and think about it. If Jesus were alive today, would he be proud to be an American? Okay, would he stand up during the seventh inning stretch and sing "God Bless"? America. Okay, would he, would he say that this is one nation under God? And that's an interesting question, right? And I'll go ahead and tell you, even among the body of Jesus here, Jesus' family, like we're all united in Christ, even among this room right now, depending on who I hand the microphone to next, we would get a very, very different answer to that question. Some people would stand up and say, Jesus loves this version of America. And some people would stand up and say Jesus would hate this version of America. Some people would stand up and say Jesus would speak with a prophetic voice and challenge America to a better future. Other people would stand up and say Jesus would speak with a prophetic voice and challenge us to get back to the past, to the golden days, to traditional American values. And back and forth it would go. Now, even though this is a hard question to agree on, one thing we can all agree on when it comes to politics today in America is that you cannot ignore it. Can you? It's loud, it's angry, and it's everywhere. It's on your TV. It's on your phones. It's in your church, sorry. It's in your kids' schools. They come home and they want to talk about it because they heard something about it. It's at your work. It's at the lunch table. It literally affects every avenue and every arena of your life. And so it's hard not to engage in it, and thus it's hard not to pick a side, but it's even harder to know the right side. Because Democrats are pulling Jesus over here. And Republicans are pulling Jesus over here. And they're saying he's left. And they're saying he's right. And they're saying he's conservative. But they're saying he's liberal. I mean, poor Jesus. He must be confused. Somebody help Jesus. No, okay, here's the deal. I, I don't really know how patriotic Jesus would be today. But what I do know is how political he was when he walked the earth. And I'll, I'll just be clear with you. Jesus was not confused about politics. In fact, I believe Jesus made the single most politically charged claim ever in the history of history, which makes him the most politically charged human being ever in the history of history. And it points to the very core of his identity. 
as he relates to us. You know what Jesus said? This is what he said. He said, I'm the king. Period. I'm the king. Period. Not Caesar. Me. I'm the king. Not Obama. And not Trump. I'm the president of all presidents. I'm the prime minister of all prime ministers. I'm the king of all kings. I'm the lord of all lords. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I was, I became, and I will come again. And one day every president, prime minister, and king's knee will bow and their tongue will confess that I'm the lord of lords. I'm the king, period, right? So Democrats, that means I'm not on your side. Republicans, that means I'm not on your side. No, you're on my side. Because I'm the king, I rule. Now, whoo, Okay, man. Hey, you, now you see? You see, right? Listen, that's, that, now that's politically charged. And okay, and he doesn't even leave you a choice of which side to choose, does he? Now I want to prove this to you because some of you are like, okay, well, that's, that's a little gruff. I didn't, I didn't read that in my Bible. Well, let me show you. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. At the very beginning of Mark's gospel, when Jesus literally starts his ministry, this is what he says. It says, uh, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, and these are red letters, Y'all, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. So repent and believe in the gospel. Now, uh, for those of you who are more scrupulous, detail-oriented readers of your Bible, maybe for those of you who have your Bible open today, let me ask you, uh, what does Jesus say before this passage in Mark? What does he say before it? Okay, trick question, all right? Because that would be nothing. Nothing. He says nothing before us. This is the very first thing the gospel author of Mark puts on the lips of Jesus. And if you've ever heard a story or read a book or watched a movie, you know that the beginning of the story and the end of the story are important, right? They serve as bookends. The beginning kind of foreshadows the theme of the story and the conclusion brings it to its climax and resolution, right? And at the beginning, Mark says... This is Jesus' agenda. The kingdom is here, right? We hear the proclamation of the king. And then at the end, we see the coronation of the king on the cross, right? These are the bookends. The whole thing's about the kingdom, at least according to Mark. Now, you know what makes Mark's gospel so special? Well, a couple things. First off, it's believed to be the earliest story of Jesus written. Before Matthew, before Luke, before John. In fact, many scholars believe that Matthew and Luke used Mark's gospel as a source for their gospels. You know what else makes it special? Many scholars believe that Mark's gospel is actually Peter's gospel. Like the apostle Peter. Like Mark was a scribe for Peter, and he took Peter's words, he took Peter's stories, and wrote them down. And Peter was the leader of the apostles of Jesus. So this is important stuff here, right? Now I want to point out to you two words in this passage. The word gospel and the word repent. Repent. Because while we've spiritualized these words today, back in the first century, they had huge political undertones. And I want to pull those out for you today. First, repent. You know what the word repent means? Jesus calls us to repent when it comes to his kingdom. Do you know what it means? It actually comes from the Greek word metanoeo. metanoeo. And uh, we've tended to spiritualize that word over the year. Repent, right? You hear like preachers say it like that. Or in Sunday school, you heard it's a 180 degree turn. You, you turn and change your ways. Well, that's all true in a spiritual context. But in the first century when this was written, the word repent had very, uh, a very political meaning. And it meant something like to change your allegiance. To change your allegiance. Like from one side to the other. From one army to the other. Or from one kingdom to the other. Now, do you see? Do you see? Next, the word gospel. Gospel. You know what the word gospel means? It comes from the Greek word euangelion. And again, it's a word that we've spiritualized over the years. But back then in the first century, it had a very political context and when, it was, uh, when it was used. It meant something like the announcement of the coming king. Uh, basically, this is what Caesar would do. Uh, anytime Caesar would travel around the Roman Empire, he would send before him into the cities that he was going to go into a herald. Right, A proclaimer, a preacher, if you will. And that preacher would go into the town, and they'd get a soapbox, put it in the middle of the town square, and they'd stand up and say, hear the gospel. Hear ye, hear ye, the good news, the euangelion, the king is coming to town, Caesar. And he brings peace on earth, he's the savior of the world, he is the son of God. Hear the gospel, hear the announcement of the king. 
Now, again, do you see? Do you see the political undertones that we've lost 2,000 years later from the happening and the telling of the story? So perhaps today, if I could translate Jesus for you into our 21st century words and just pull out all the political charged emotion of this statement, maybe I could translate it like this. This is what Jesus says. He says, hear the good news. God's kingdom is here. I'm the king to change your allegiance. Here's the reality, y'all. Every single last one of us in this room have a throne on our hearts. We do. And something will sit on that throne. Something will rule you from moment to moment. You will worship something. And Jesus wants that throne. But Jesus allows you to choose what sits on that throne because he doesn't want his love to be coerced or forced. He wants you to choose him day in and day out. Now, the reality for most of us is, is that many of us are allowing appetites to sit on that throne. You're allowing appetites to rule you. Or some of us are allowing ambition to rule you. Some of us are allowing approval to rule you. And many of us in America today are allowing politics to rule us. You see, look at, you know why the political conversation is so emotionally charged and so angry and so divisive? It has so much apocalyptic doom attached to it. Well, it's because many of us look to our politics and to our political leaders as our saviors. And we believe it's them and their decisions and their governance that holds our destiny and our future. Hey, Jesus speaks a different word today, and he calls you to repent and to change your allegiance and to give your allegiance to a far greater and far more powerful kingdom. All right, now, if you're new here, if this is like your first time today, you're probably like, whoa, I didn't know churches talked about this, this kind of stuff, all right? Well, at, at our church, we do, basically there are, are two kinds of churches. There are churches that never talk about it because they're scared. And there are churches who talk about it too much, right? Because like they've, they've made their politics their God. We try to stay in the Goldilocks zone, okay? Not too hot, not too cold, just right, right? Okay, but, so I talk about it some. And anytime I do, last year during the election cycle, we preached a sermon on politics. It was, it was crazy. And okay, anytime I bring it up, I always get pushed back. From somebody. Sometimes it's my friends. They'll send me like a text or they'll grab me after service. They'll send me an email. They're like, Tyler, 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 Tyler. Don't you know the church needs to stay out of politics? I mean, come on. Separation of church and state, you know. Tyler, don't you know you need to stick to the matters of life that you're an expert on as a pastor? The spiritual matters of life. Now, if I'm not an expert on politics, then neither are you. Come on. You're a banker. You know what? I hereby give your wife permission T tomorrow night, when you're yelling at the television about politics, to say, honey, honey, stick to the matters you're an expert on. Selling insurance and eating potato chips. Okay, because that's what you do, right? So you see what I'm saying? Come on, we've got to talk about this. No, and on the real, here's why, here's why. Because if Jesus really is king, if he really is king of the universe, if he really is king of you and your kingdom, then that means he can't just be king of our spiritual lives. He can't just be king of our private lives. He has to be king of our public lives, too. So here's what I want to do for the rest of our time. I want to challenge you to change your allegiance. Because when it comes to our politics, some of us have our priorities out of whack. For example, first, first. If your politics inform your Jesus rather than vice versa, then Jesus is not really your king, at least not completely. Now, here's what a lot of us have the tendency to do. A lot of us have the tendency to give our political filter prominence over our Jesus filter, right? So when it comes to an issue or an opinion or a, a value that comes up in the American discussion, we first filter it through what our politician or what our political party, the RNC, the DNC would say, and then we go look to King Jesus to help us find support. You know, we go find a scripture to support and prop up our political position. Now, if that's you, let's just call it like it is. You don't worship King Jesus. You use Jesus as a servant to your political party. You're not trying to find Jesus. You're using Jesus' justification. And that means he's not really, truly, completely your king. Maybe I could say it like this. 
If your faith values shift with your political party's values, then Jesus is not your king. Because 2,000 years ago, he did his thing, and it's done. It doesn't change. It doesn't shift. Okay, so some people want to know, well, how can Jesus be on every side of every issue? How can he be Republican and Democrat, left and right, conservative and liberal? He can't. He can't. I'll tell you how. It's because he can't. And one side's wrong. Or maybe both sides are wrong. And whoever's wrong is usually using their Jesus as justification, as a servant to their politics, rather than the king over their politics. So I challenge you to take a long, hard look in the mirror and a long, hard look at Jesus and ask yourself, is that me? Is that me? Let me give you another example. Uh, If you hate your political enemies, then Jesus isn't, come on, come on, Jesus isn't completely your king. Right? Because King Jesus doesn't give us permission to hate anyone. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27, King Jesus says this. He says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are like, well, Tyler, I don't hate him. I'm just telling it like it is. Well, if you tell it like it is in a hateful way, you're hateful. Because Jesus says in Matthew 12, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what the, the, like the words you say are an actual indication of your heart. Jesus said it like this once. He said, you can tell a tree based on the fruit hanging off the tree. In the same way, you can tell a person's heart based on what they do, what they say. So it doesn't matter if they say, I'm an apple tree, I'm an apple tree, I promise. If there are oranges hanging on the tree, we all know they're an orange tree. Right? In the same way, I would challenge you to consider, what's hanging from the tree? Really? Now, I would expect, I would expect kind of the hateful dialogue and discourse to happen in the secular world, right? Outside of the body of Christ uh, in America. But you know what's crazy? I see it happen, happening just as often among the body of Christ. Like All I got to do is get on Facebook, and I see Christian friends on the right, Christian friends on the left, just at each other's throat trying to go for the jugular. <laughs> I mean, it's just, okay, you want to know whether or not you're hateful? Review your Facebook the last 365 days, and then pray for forgiveness, because some of you are going to need it, right? But, but like, it's Christian on Christian. It's, and it, it, it really, it blows my mind. So I just want to remind you, um, there is only one entrance requirement to heaven. And you know what that is? Your voting record. No, it's not your voting record. It's not any good thing or any bad thing you do. There is only one entrance requirement to heaven, and that is Jesus. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. We're saved by grace, through faith, and through the faithfulness of Jesus. One day, when we all stand before God in judgment, he's not going to separate the right to the right and the left to the left, as some of you might wish he would. Okay? He's not going to separate Republicans and Democrats. He's not even going to separate the good from the bad because when he looks out in the audience of humanity, he's not going to see good and bad. He's going to see bad and worse. And in that moment, he's going to separate the Jesus people because Jesus is the entrance requirement. Right? So with that being said, will you do me a favor? We've done this before. It's just good to remind ourselves. Will you look around the room for a second and just make eye contact? It's going to be kind of awkward. Make eye contact with like two or three people you don't know. You know just kind of give them a little you know, head nod. Okay, go ahead. Do it. It's a little awkwardness. Yeah, just embrace the awkward. Okay, now check this out. These are Jesus people, which means you're stuck with them forever. And some of them voted for Trump. Lord help them. Some of them voted for Hillary. They are card carrying Democrats. Lord help them. Some of them are independents because they can't make up their mind. Some of them voted libertarian because they never want to win an election. All right? But, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on. Hey, if you can't laugh at yourself, laugh at somebody else. But check this out. Check this out. This is my point. This is my point. There, there should be no kingdom of this world that ever separates the kingdom of God. Ever. Ever. So speaking is optional. But speaking the truth in love is not optional. And so until you're capable of speaking the truth in love, maybe you need to work on your heart before you speak. How about this next one? Third. If your political leader can do no wrong, 
then you've made them king, right? You've deified them. Okay, now check this out. All right, and this is going to ruffle some feathers. That's okay. Uh, uh, President Trump has been in office for 10 months now, right? 10 months? Yeah, about 10 months. And over the course of the 10 months, I don't even have to think about examples. I can just go ahead and tell you that he's had character mistakes and he's had leadership mistakes. Now, you know how I know that? Because he's human. And humans make mistakes. Now, for the loyal Trump supporters in the room, already something's coming up inside and you're like, well, what about Hillary? What about Hillary? She's human too. She's going to need the grace of Jesus. Just like President Trump and just like every single last one of us. Running for president does not make you a god. Winning the presidential election does not make you a god. (laughs) Rising from the dead makes you a god. And there's only been one king who's pulled that one off, right? You know what I almost did during the 2016 election cycle? I almost said, you know what? In 2020, I'm just going to vote for whatever uh, politician is the most honest, vulnerable, and transparent about their shortcomings. Politics aside, I'm just going to vote for the most honest one because, you know, I believe that there's character and humility and character makes a leader worth following, right? I'm going to vote for the person who says, you know what? I did that in the past and I own that and I'm sorry for that and I promise you I'll never do it again. You know what? I believe that in, my, in the past, but I, I changed my position. Most people change positions over time. I changed my position. That was the wrong way, and now I want to do it the right way. Wouldn't that be refreshing, right? But then I realized that if I chose to try to vote for that, like that politician, I wouldn't vote because they're just not out there. It's always, well, they're interpreting the polls wrong, and we've got this poll, or, you know, that's fake news, or they're lying, or that's a lie, or whatever it is, right? Now, I don't even blame the politicians, for approaching attacks on them like that. Because you want to know why they have to project this persona of perfection? Because that's what we expect of them. We don't want a flawed leader, right? We definitely don't want a flawed politician because so many of us have our hope wrapped up in politics. So how can they be? No, they can't. They must be our political savior, right? Hey, look, that's you. I got good news for you. We have a king who actually is perfect, and he's available to you today. His name is King Jesus, and he rules over all the kings, all the presidents. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this about King Jesus. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Uh, There's this interesting time uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 11 where John the Baptist sends some of his disciples to talk to Jesus. Now, you don't know why? Because John the Baptist was beginning to doubt Jesus, which is crazy. John the Baptist was like Jesus' campaign manager, right? He's like his communications director. Because before Jesus hit the scene, John the Baptist was out there and he was preaching Jesus. He's like, this is the guy. Here comes the king. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Like he was Jesus' guy. But then all of a sudden... Jesus comes on the scene, and things start to go bad for John the Baptist. He starts losing his disciples. He gets thrown in prison. Eventually, he gets executed for speaking truth to power. And right before his execution, he goes through this season of doubt. And so he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, Hey, um, ask Jesus if he's, if he's really the guy, because I'm, I'm, like, I'm beginning to question it. And this is what Jesus says back to his disciples. He says, uh, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to him. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Now, question, what king has ever accomplished that? Today in our country, we debate health care. Jesus dispensed it. And one day he'll issue a cure-all for all, according to Revelation 21. He can do no wrong. The rest of us, we're just human. And we need a true Savior. Okay, next, next. Let's keep going. Aren't you glad you came to church today? All right, fourth. Uh, If your rights as an American take precedence over your responsibilities as a Christian, ever, ever. 
that Jesus is not at least completely your king. Let me say it like this. Next slide. The American Constitution is not God's measuring stick. The American culture is not God's measuring stick. Jesus is God's measuring stick. Right, now, here's the deal. The American Constitution is brilliant. It's one of the most brilliant political documents ever written of its kind. Perhaps the most brilliant. But it's not perfect. It's not infallible. Is it, when the American Constitution was or, originally written, it considered a black man three-fifths of a human being. And since then, there's been 27 amendments added to it, right? So it's not perfect. Brilliant in many ways, but not perfect. And God knows our American culture is not perfect. Is it Lord help us. And yet so many of us feel this cross pressure to conform to culture, right? Why? See, the Christian worldview says that one day Jesus is going to rip open the sky. Could be today. Could be after the service is over with. We don't know. He's going to rip open the sky. And in that moment, uh, we are going to be measured not on how we conform to culture, not on how we committed to the Constitution, but how we conformed and committed to Jesus, the King. So everybody wants to talk about, you know, being on the right side of history. Well, sure, you need to get on the right side of history. And you know whose side that is? Jesus' side of history. And you know what's so funny? As you get closer and closer to death, it, that's, it just starts to become clear to you. I've never sat in a hospital room by someone's bed when they're dying and had them say to me, Tyler, will you read me a passage from the Constitution? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Next, fifth. If Jesus' kingdom looks more American than global, then you've got the wrong kingdom. At least you don't have the highest kingdom because Jesus' kingdom movement was a global movement, which means its values must have global application. You realize the kingdom of God and the church uh, have existed for literally hundreds of years before America ever existed, right? You realize that in heaven someday, there will be more non-English-speaking, non-white people there than English-speaking white people. Jesus wasn't even white. Right? Middle Eastern, olive skin, Aramaic-speaking, the whole nine yards. Now, I, honestly, though, I think the whole conversation is kind of fruitless, you know, like, because Jesus never... Cons cons never uh, considered his kingdom to be geographical to begin with. Jesus wanted his kingdom to be personal. He doesn't want to own land. He wants to own human hearts. And at the end of the day, that's where the kingdom of God is. On every two by two foot square piece of ground that someone's heart who is under the kingship of Jesus stands. So kingdom people, let's let new life explode from the ground that we stand on. Whether we're in one nation under God or whether we're in a nation that completely is devoid of God. Not last, certainly not least. If you believe some version of America is the hope of the world, or if you believe the end of America would be the end of the world, you've got the wrong king and the wrong kingdom. Because the message of the Bible is clear. Jesus is the hope of the world. The church is his body in the world, and he's given the church a simple mission. And it's not to make America great, it's to make disciples, which in the end will make America very great. So look, okay, hear me. Hear me now, hear me. Before you go to another church next week, hear me. I'm not anti-America. I'm thankful. I'm proud to be an American. I am not so ungrateful to realize the freedoms and the comforts that my nation affords me. I'm thankful for those. Okay, there's a lot of countries that couldn't preach a message like this in. So I'm thankful. I love America. I just want you to know that as a member of King Jesus' kingdom, I love his kingdom far more. My allegiance to his kingdom is far greater than my allegiance to any community, any person, any kingdom out there. You know what's interesting? Jesus, Jesus goes after our allegiances to everything. He even goes after your allegiance to your family. You read, you read some of those passages? There's just one time where Jesus says, uh, okay, if you want to be my disciple, you must take your father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, even yourself, if you want to be my disciple. Now, does he really want us to hate our family? Of course not. But he's using the rhetorical device of exaggeration to make this point. I should be your supreme allegiance, period. I'm the king. Be about my kingdom. Now, here's the fun part, though. 
You know what it looks like to be about his kingdom? <laughs> it looks like new life. It looks like compassion. It looks like love exploding on this planet. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, it looks like making my kingdom come and my will be done on earth right now as it is in heaven. And that's fun, y'all. That's fun work. It's hard work, but it's fun work. Okay, okay so let me ask you a question. Will there be any hungry people in heaven? Not a trick question. Will there be any hungry people in heaven? Yes. No. So there should be no hungry people in our community today. It's fun to feed people who need food. It's just fun to eat, right? <laughs> Will there be any sick people in heaven? No. So we should care for every sick person this side of heaven. Will the sting of death and the pain of grief be in heaven? Then we should come around every widow, every widower, every orphan in our community and rel relational circles this side of heaven. Hey, will Will the kingdom of heaven be all white or all black or all brown? No, then our kingdom communities today should be communities of belonging for all people. Right, okay, well, here's a good one. All right, some of you need to hear this today. Will anyone ever feel rushed or hurried or tired in heaven? Then some of us need to bring God's kingdom to bear on our kingdom and our schedule today. Will there be any reason to fear, any reason to worry, any reason to be selfish, or any reason to hate in heaven? Let's make his kingdom come then. Will there be anybody who lives impoverished in heaven? Will there be systemic injustices that keep people down in heaven? Well, then let's make the kingdom come, y'all. Okay, will, there, will, heaven, will heaven be a place of unimaginable beauty? Absolutely. And that means the church should be a place right now on earth of creativity, of ingenuity, of innovation. Like people should be drawn to us because they see boldness and they see this, this, uh, this willingness to take the risk because we think that the, God, the size of our faith should not insult the size of our God. We should live outside of our comfort zones and inspire people. Hey, will, will heaven be a place of unimaginable joy? Absolutely. So the church should be known for joy, right? And yet, how in the world has the church come to be known more for rituals and traditions, for rules and regulations, and for judgment and condemnation rather than hope and healing? I'll tell you how. It's because the church in many ways has lost its way, but let us find the way, and it is the way, straight to the throne of King Jesus. Here's what I'm saying. One day, Jesus will return and heaven will fall right? But we're not called to wait for that day. No, we're called to make what will be, be. Now, as kingdom people, and what a wonderful life-giving purpose that is. And I'm just crazy enough to think that there's a big group of people that calls Northeast their home, who's ready to do just that, who believes that the last chapter of human history doesn't necessarily have to hold the best part of the human story. No, we could bring that to bear now, today. So, kingdom people, will you do me a favor? Will you stand up with me right now? Stand up with me right now. And, uh, and this is what I want to do. I want to pronounce our Jesus Creed for this season of our church's life together. But before I do, uh, I want to read you a quote that I saw one of my favorite Jesus followers, Bob Goff, write not more than a few weeks ago in the middle of this crazy hot political debate. This is what he wrote. Huh. He wrote, what distracts us will eventually define us. And isn't it true? So let us allow this to define us, our Jesus Creed. <clears throat> we say this with me. Jesus is God, our King. He was, he created, and he promised. Then he became, he lived, and he died. For God is love. He rose, he sent, and he ascended. Now he revives, he heals, and he perfects. For Jesus lives in us. God is Jesus, our King. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that that would be what defines us. Distract us with a higher, grander vision of what humanity and the church could be. Let us catch a glimpse of King Jesus ruling in heaven so that we can bring that rule to bear on earth. It's in his powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being here today. We're excited that you've come. If this is your first time with us, we'd love to say hi. Check us out at the guest kiosk in the lobby. If you've got something you need to pray about, if Tyler stirred something up in your heart or, or God stirred something in you, we'd love to pray with you in the fireside room. Thanks for being here today.